द वर्क बिफोर अस इन दिस टॉक स्वामी विवेकानंदा लेज अ सिस्टमैटिक प्लान फॉर वॉट ही थिंग्स नीड्स टू बी डन इन इंडिया गोइंग फॉरवर्ड हियर आर सम ऑफ द की आइडियाज ऑफ हिस टॉक ए द विडेंटिक डिक्टम ऑफ द सॉलिडैरिटी ऑफ ऑल लाइफ इज बिकमिंग मोर एंड मोर रेलिवेंट विथ एवरी पासिंग डे The watchword and the essence have been preached in the days of yore when the Vedantic truth was first discovered the solidarity of all life one of the causes which led to the degeneration of india was the narrowing of our views narrowing the scope of our actions b a historical perspective the development of the greek and the indian mind two curious nations there have been sprung of the same race but placed in different circumstances and environments working out the problems of life each in its own particular way i mean the ancient hindu indian and the ancient greek ancient indian mind surrounded by the snow caps of the himalayas and fresh rivers and eternal forests the indian aryan turned his vision inward his natural instinct combined with the sublime scenery and a super fine brain the indian aryan became introspective and hence the analysis of his own mind became the great theme of the indian aryan as a result from india have sprung the analytical sciences ancient greek mind the greek on the other hand arrived at a part of the earth which was more beautiful than sublime the beautiful islands of the grecian archipelago nature all around him generous yet simple his mind naturally went outside and hence the greek mind wanted to analyze the external world as a result from greece we have the sciences of generalization historical perspective kant the subsequent degradation of the indian mind in art and sculpture idealized conceptions and symmetry of form gave way to a tremendous ornate and florid style in music the soul stirring ideas and free standing notes of the ancient sanskrit music became but a jumble of notes a confused mass of curves even in religion there came the most horrible degradations where we spent time on discussing whether we should drink a glass of water with the right hand or the left now The ancient Greek mind is meeting the ancient Indian mind on the soil of India it is an opportunity to make ourselves more universal Today the ancient Greek is meeting the ancient Hindu on the soil of India Thus slowly and silently the leaven has come the broadening the life giving and the revivalist movement that we see all around us has been worked out by these forces together a broader and more generous conception of life is before us and although at first we have been deluded a little and wanted to narrow things down we are finding out today that these generous impulses which are at work these broader conceptions of life are the logical interpretation of what is in our ancient books they are the carrying out to the rigorously logical effect of the primary conceptions of our own ancestors and all the time we have been making ourselves smaller and smaller and dissociating ourselves contrary to the plans laid down in our scriptures to become broad to go out to amalgamate to universalize is the end of our aims the way forward several dangers are in the way and one is that of the extreme conception that we are the people in the world with all my love for india and with all my patriotism and veneration for the ancients i cannot but think that we have to learn many things from other nations we must be always ready to sit at the feet of all for mark you every one can teach us great lessons at the same time we must not forget that we have also to teach a great lesson to the world that we did not go out to compare things with other nations did not mark the workings that have been all around us has been the one great cause of the degradation of the indian mind the more you go out and travel among the nations of the world the better for you and for your country if you had done that for hundreds of years past 
you would not be here today at the feet of every nation that wants to rule India. The first manifest effect of life is expansion. You must expand if you want to live. The moment you have ceased to expand, death is upon you, danger is ahead. Through this expansion our quota of offering to the general mass of human knowledge, our contribution to the general upheaval of the world, is going out to the external world. Swami Vivekananda's message on what's to be done in India going forward. Indian ideas have always gone out into the world in the past. The gift of India is the gift of religion and philosophy and wisdom and spirituality. And religion does not want cohorts to march before its path and clear its way. Wisdom and philosophy do not want to be carried on floods of blood. Wisdom and philosophy do not march upon bleeding human bodies, do not march with violence but come on the wings of peace and love. And that has always been so. To my mind that is the argument why our religion is truer than any other religion, because it never conquered, because it never shed blood, because its mouth always shed on all, words of blessing, of peace, words of love and sympathy. It is here and here alone that toleration and sympathy have become practical, it is theoretical in every other country, it is here and here alone that the Hindu builds mosques for the Mohammedans and churches for the Christians. Mesmerism of Indian Thought If a foreigner takes up our literature to study, at first it is disgusting to him, there is not the same stir, perhaps, the same amount of go that rouses him instantly. Compare the tragedies of Europe with our tragedies. The one is full of action that rouses you for the moment, but when it is over there comes the reaction and everything is gone, washed off as it were from your brains. Indian tragedies are like the mesmerist's power, quiet, silent, but as you go on studying them they fascinate you, you cannot move, you are bound, and whoever has dared to touch our literature has felt the bondage and is there bound forever. Highways for ideas have opened up and the time is propitious for the spread of Indian ideas. Thoughts like merchandise can only run through channels made by somebody. Roads have to be made before even thought can travel from one place to another, and whenever in the history of the world a great conquering nation has arisen, linking the different parts of the world together, then has poured through these channels the thought of India and thus entered into the veins of every race. Every part of the world has been linked to every other part, and electricity plays a most marvellous part as the new messenger. Under all these circumstances, we find again India reviving and ready to give her own quota to the progress and civilization of the world. The problem before us, therefore, is assuming larger proportions every day. It is not only that we must revive our own country, that is a small matter, I am an imaginative man and my idea is the conquest of the whole world by the Hindu race. Swami Vivekananda's message for the conquest of the world by Indian thought. 1. We have also been great conquerors. The story of our conquest has been described by that noble emperor of India, Asoka, as the conquest of religion and spirituality. 2. Once more the world must be conquered by India. This is the dream of my life, and I wish that each one of you who hear me today will have the same dream in your minds, and stop not till you have realized the dream. What ideas must be spread life-giving principles, not masses of superstitions? There is the man today who after drinking the cup of Western wisdom, thinks that he knows everything. He laughs at the ancient sages. All Hindu thought to him is arrant trash, philosophy mere child's prattle, and religion the superstition of fools. On the other hand, there is the man educated, but a sort of monomaniac, who runs to the other extreme and wants to explain the omen of this and that. He has philosophical and metaphysical, 
and Lord knows what other puerile explanations for every superstition that belongs to his peculiar race, or his peculiar gods, or his peculiar village. Every little village superstition is to him a mandate of the Vedas, and upon the carrying out of it, according to him, depends the national life. You must beware of this. The fact is that we have many superstitions, many bad spots and sores on our body, these have to be excised, cut off and destroyed, but these do not destroy our religion, our national life, our spirituality. Every principle of religion is safe, and the sooner these black spots are purged away, the better the principles will shine, the more gloriously. Stick to them. Why Indian religion is the only religion to even attempt to be the universal religion? According to Swami Vivekananda, Every religion makes the claim of being the universal religion of the world, but perhaps there will never be such a thing. However, if there is a religion that may lay such a claim, it will be the Hindu religion. Why is this so? All other religions are built around the life of a historical figure. If the historicity is disproved in any way then the whole fabric of the religion tumbles to the ground. On the other hand, the truths of our religion, although we have persons by the score, do not depend upon persons. Our allegiance is to principles always and not to the person. The principles of our religion are safe and must be kept safe. It is strange that in spite of the degradation that seized upon the rays again and again, these principles of the Vedanta were never tarnished. No one, however wicked, ever dared to throw dirt upon them. Our scriptures are the best preserved scriptures in the world. Compared to other books there have been no interpolations, no text torturing, no destroying of the essence of the thought in them. It is there just as it was first, directing the human mind towards the ideal, the goal. The apparently contradictory ideas in the Vedas actually show the various steps to a higher goal by the human mind. It is foolish to attempt to prove that the whole of the Vedas is dualistic. It is equally foolish to attempt to prove that the whole of the Vedas is non-dualistic. They are dualistic and non-dualistic both. We understand them better today in the light of newer ideas. These are but different conceptions leading to the final conclusion that both dualistic and monistic conceptions are necessary for the evolution of the mind and therefore the Vedas preach them. In mercy to the human race the Vedas show the various steps to the higher goal. So long as we have a body and so long as we are deluded by the idea of our identity with the body, so long as we have five senses and see the external world, we must have a personal God. But there may be times in the lives of sages when the human mind transcends as it were its own limitations, man goes even beyond nature to the realm of which the Shruti declares, Whence words fall back with the mind without reaching it, there the human soul transcends all limitations, and then, and then alone flashes into the human soul the conception of monism. In India, inspiration came not to a single person alone, but to a class of people, the rishis of India. In all other scriptures inspiration is quoted as their authority, but this inspiration is limited to a very few persons and through them the truth came to the masses and we have all to obey them. Truth came to Jesus of Nazareth and we must all obey Him. But the truth came to the rishis of India, the mantradrashtas, the seers of thought and will come to all rishis in the future, not to talkers, not to book swallowers, not to scholars, not to philologists, but to seers of thought. True religion is that which helps us come face to face with God, such is a rishi. Religion is not going to church, or putting marks on the forehead, or dressing in a peculiar fashion, you may paint yourselves in all the colors of the rainbow. But if the heart has not been opened, if you have not realized God, it is all vain. If one has the color of the heart, he does not want any external color. That is the true religious realization. 
He who comes face to face with God, sees God alone in everything, has become a Rishi. And there is no religious life for you until you have become a Rishi. Then alone religion begins for you, now is only the preparation. Then religion dawns upon you, now you are only undergoing intellectual gymnastics and physical tortures. What needs to be done? We must, therefore, remember that our religion lays down distinctly and clearly that everyone who wants salvation must pass through the stage of Rishihud, must become a mantradrishta, must see God. That is salvation, that is the law laid down by our scriptures. We must pay all reverence to the ancient sages for their work. They were great, those ancients, but we must do greater work than they. They had hundreds of rishis in ancient India, we will have millions, we are going to have, and the sooner every one of you believes in this, the better for India, and the better for the world. If there is one common doctrine that runs through all our apparently fighting and contradictory sects, it is that all glory, power and purity are within the soul already. All admit the truth that the power is there, potential or manifest it is there, and the sooner you believe that, the better for you. All power is within you, you can do anything and everything. You can do anything and everything without even the guidance of anyone. All power is there. Stand up and express the divinity within you.